Hang on, hang on. What are y'all laughing at? So Connie got a little lost in it. That's a good thing. Look, I remember one time my dad took me to this jazz club, and that's the last place I wanted to be. But then I see this guy, and he's playing his chords with force on it. And then with a minor, I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Then he has the inner voices, and it's like he's, it's like he's singing. And I swear, the next thing I know, it, 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 it's like he floats off the stage. That guy was lost in the music. He was in it, and he took the rest of us with him. And that was a clip from Soul, the new Pixar movie starring the voices of Jamie Foxx, Tina Fey, Graham Norton. Yes, Graham Norton. It's directed by Pete Docter, the man who brought us up and Inside Out and Monsters, Inc. I'm delighted to say he joins us now from California. Hello, Pete. Happy Christmas to you. Well, thank you very much. Back at you. Yeah. Graham Norton. There'll be a number of people in the UK. I have to be honest. I'm watching the movie and I hadn't noticed that it's Graham Norton doing the doing oh. the voiceover. And then my daughter walks in and says, that's Graham Norton. And I went, no, I don't think who it actually is. Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Anyway. Yeah, um, he's fantastic. He's we were so lucky to work with him because, man, what a, what a great guy. Yeah. Well, it's the, the whole movie. The, I mean, there are so many different layers to this film. Can you just sort of start the ball rolling? because this movie is is out today, streaming on, on Disney+. Plus. There are so many aspects of this movie to get stuck into. Where did it come from? What was the starting point for Soul? Well, it kind of started watching my own kids, who are now young adults, and realizing, you know, I, I feel like I had glimpses of their personality, of who they were from the moment they were born. And then thinking, well, how is that possible, that we could be born... And I have two kids, and they're very different from each other. They have the same parents, the same environment they grew up in, and yet so different. There must be somewhere that gives us that essential essence of who we are, somewhere that trains us. And we came up with this concept of the great before. Everyone's heard of the great beyond, but this is the great before. So what happened before we were born? Where were we? What went on? And that's kind of this whole movie then uh, was an, invest an investigation from that point on. So it's like a philosophy class. It really is, yes. Yeah, you get to talk about nihilism and essentialism and all those things, that, uh, <laughs> but hopefully dramatized in a way that makes it fun. Could this have been done if you hadn't done Inside Out? I mean, what, what, is it a natural mm -hmm. kind of, it's got nothing to do with that film, but is it a, nat it was, can you see it as, as one movie, to, as a stepping stone to this one? Well, they're similar in that they're so, both of them have very abstract elements that we're representing in some way. And I do feel like in a way, Inside Out was a good training ground for me for this one. Inside Out is looking inward, like what is it, why do we have emotions and what purpose do they serve? And this one's more like looking out, like, you know, what the heck's going on? How do we fit into all this? What are we meant to be doing with our lives? Which is, you know, kind of heady stuff for animated cartoons, but why not? Why not? Yes, but you're right, those questions, you know, what is life for? What makes it worth it? What's it all about? They're kind of big questions to uh, to tackle. So let's drill down into our main character, Joe Gardner. Tell us tell okay. us about him and why he is the guy who takes us on this story. Yeah, Joe is a teacher, a middle school band teacher, but he's kind of suffering through that because what he really wants is to be a professional musician. He was born to play. He feels, you know, he's a jazz musician. He's good, but he's just never kind of gotten the shot until today. And one of his old students, a little embarrassing because, you know, it's his student who's now a professional who's offered him a position to potentially play in one of the big uh, acts, uh, one of the big names in jazz, Dorothea Williams. Of course, this is all stuff we made up. She doesn't actually yeah. exist. But so Joe has a chance to play. He does brilliantly. He's brought, she says, we'll see how you do, show up tonight. And then he falls into a manhole and dies. And while he's escaping, he refuses to go into the great beyond. He ends up in the great before where he's stuck with this soul who doesn't want to go live. So this is uh, the Tina Fey character. Her name is 22. She says, nuts to life, that looks like a lot of pain, suffering, and disappointment. She would be friends with Nietzsche. You know, she just doesn't want anything to do with it. And Joe needs to convince her that life is worth it. And so that's the, the bulk of the movie is, you know, figuring that stuff out. I wonder when you were constructed, so we have kind of two planes that this story takes place in, down on the earth and then in the great before and sort of hints mm -hmm. the great and, uh, and the great beyond and the kind of elevator into the sky. And it did occur to me, first time that we went up there, Pete, that wars mm -hmm. have been fought over what happens up there and who gets in and who doesn't get in and the, the nature of the soul. You know, this, this over the centuries, 
there have been wars about this and now you're portraying it in in a movie did you have any <laughs> did you have any concerns that people might take against this oh yes yes uh in fact that was one of the big like when we first pitched it people were like whoa we're gonna upset half of the the world population because you know you have belief systems that are kind of not in concert with each other. So we did a lot of research, both to discover what are the hot buttons, but also just to see what they could teach us about how humanity looks at the nature of the soul. Um, and we found that most of them talked about the soul as being non-physical, vaporous, um, invisible, not helpful because we gotta, you know, we gotta shoot something. We gotta put something on the screen here. So we had to make up a lot of it. I do think, I mean, we, we will see as people watch the movie, how many get upset at us. But I feel as though we were able to sidestep most of the big hot buttons in the movie. Yes, yes, you did. I mean, I, although I did think that as the movie finishes, uh, we won't give anything away, but to have a Pixar movie which actually dares to even float the question, what if life is meaningless? <laughs> that's a that's a big deal, Pete. You know, that's 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 heavy duty stuff, isn't it? Well, that's what we all I aren't don't all of us on certain days go. Yeah, you know what? There's no point to any of this. This is all absurd. So yeah, you got to face the reality of the how people feel. I mean, we hope we dream that it's not the case, and I think in the end we we are able to unseat that. But you have to at least bring it up as a possibility. So do you think so? So the people who are sort of saying maybe it has something in common with It's a Wonderful Life. Have mm. we got something? Yeah. I mean, that's one of its sort of, you know, the films that we looked at. Um, we also looked at the Albert Brooks film, Defending Your Life, um, Heaven Can Wait, of course. You know, there's a number of films. Anytime, and this is not to say this is how we start making movies. I don't start by looking at other movies and saying, how can I change that and make it into something new? You generally start with an idea and then you recognize, oh, other people have touched on this before. I'm not the first one. So I'm going to go back and learn from as many of those other films as I possibly can. What worked? What didn't? What would I do differently? And so that's kind of in the spirit of what I'm talking about. A Christmas Carol. Uh, oh, there's a strange one, a Shirley Temple film called Bluebird of Happiness, which is uh, oddly, it does talk about before life a little bit. Okay. And it's a, it's a weird one. How do you go about even thinking about drawing a soul? Yes, that is a good question. Uh, we wanted the souls to be basically very simplified humans, right? And we wanted them to be recognizable in addition to all the research of the non-physical vaporous kind of thing, we wanted uh, to see our characters' faces. So they can't just be complete like blobs, you know. So we made decisions to like anything we can get rid of. We don't need ears and hair. Maybe let's just make, okay, eyes, mouth. We'll get rid of the nose. Even the arms and legs are most of the time gone. When they need them, they can kind of emerge from this fog and then they go back away. But um, they're kind of, our thought was that before life, they're a little less formed. They're more kind of ambiguous. And then life changes you. So by the time you see the souls that, and one of the conceits of the film is that souls who have lived become mentors to souls who have not yet lived. So you see like Mother Teresa or, or um, you know, some of the other successful souls that are passing along their wisdom. Some of their attributes that they had in life will be inherited by the soul. So the soul has changed a little bit, even to the point where we said, okay, before life, all the souls have um, purple irises. It's you know non-specific to any sort of race or culture or anything. And then by the end, once once they've lived, they they inherit the the colored eyes that they they would have on earth. So you know all sorts of thoughts like that. You you end up thinking deeply about this stuff. <laughs> I'm, yeah, no, I'm I'm sure. Did you always have quite a clear idea Pete, in your head as to what? It's not heaven. You've made it very clear, but what the great before and the great beyond that, that when we're not on earth, you knew what it would look like. No, we had some like uh, early drawings that had um, rainbow colors. And so uh, the, the idea that it was constantly shifting and changing to try again to to reference that non-physical idea that, you know, it's not grounded the way earth is. Um, but it, it was a it was a discovery. Just like the, the story itself, you know, the making of the story. Why is our main character, Joe, why is he a jazz musician? We heard this story that um, Herbie Hancock, the great jazz pianist, told. He said, I was playing with 
Miles Davis, amazing jazz legend, Miles Davis. And he said, we were having a great tour and they had this concert that was great. It was like the pinnacle of the tour. And he said, in the middle of the show, I played this chord, and this is Herbie talking, that was so wrong that he worried that he ruined the entire show and reduced that great night to rubble. But he said, instead of ruining it, he said, Miles took a breath and he played some notes and he made the chord seem like it was absolutely correct. And he said, I took me years to figure out how he did that, but he said, Miles didn't judge that as being right or wrong. He just took it as something new that happened. And he did what any great jazz musician should try to do, which is take whatever is given to you and turn it into something of value. And I just thought that is so cool. That's so poignant. And it seemed as though Joe uh, jazz was a perfect metaphor for everything we were trying to say in the film. And so from that point on, it was pretty locked in. That's actually what led us to make Joe our first African-American character because it felt wrong in a, in a tradition like jazz, which you could equally call black improvisational music. You know, it really grew out of African-American culture. And so a lot of those, a lot of this, you know, what seem like insignificant choices early on have a big downstream ripple effect. It is, of course, an extraordinary spectacle, which people will be, they know that's what they're going to get when they see a Pixar movie. And I, there were a number of times when I kind of gasped, mm. listing in no particular order, tears, fingers, leaves, and pizza, which is not, none of those are spoilers. People will get that. Are there some things technically, Pete, that you can do in this movie that you couldn't do five years ago? Yeah. Well, I think our main characters altogether, we probably wouldn't have been able to do. A lot of what you'd see in the great before just technically was impossible. And it does seem like every few years, the technology just leaps ahead. Unfortunately, what also leaps ahead is our imagination and our appetite. So we constantly demand more and more, even though, you know, I think we could, somebody told me this recently, we could go back and render, um, we could recreate the frames for Toy Story faster than you can watch it. You know, at the time, each frame, each frame, and there's 24 of those every second, took like a day to render. Now it just is so fast, you you know, but we keep asking more and more of it. So there's kind of no, it's a, it's an arms race. <laughs> yeah, well, Joe Gardner's fingers are, you know, it, worth the price of entrance. Actually, mm. on, on, on the side of the price of entrance, clearly that there isn't going to be one. The movie is, it's out today. People can watch it on, on Disney+. Plus. Does that change the way a story is told or the way you approach a movie if you'd known that this was going to not be for most people in the cinema? Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. I mean... In this case, obviously, as you say, we made it to be seen in the cinema, so there is a great attention to detail, not only in the storytelling, but in the visuals and what you see. And uh, I do hope people have good sound systems because the music is fantastic and the design of the the, the sound is, is beautifully done. Ren Kleiss, who was our sound designer. Um, I think it's a commitment that Disney has said, look, we're going to put our best stuff forward. This is not just the cast-offs. This is uh, some of the best material we have, that's we're putting that on Disney Plus. That's the value we're setting, and so um, that's what people should should expect from the service. Now it sounds like I'm shilling for the company. I guess I, I sort of am, but uh, you know uh, th we're proud to be part of that. Uh, well, um, we wish you a happy Christmas, Pete. Thank you very much indeed, and uh, and congratulations on Soul. I think you know it's obviously a spectacle which people I think. Here's the thing. People will go and watch it. And after that, they'll want to watch it again. And then after the second time, they'll want to watch it a third time because there's so much going on. That's what I'm saying. Thank you.